Hi, and welcome everyone. Good afternoon and good morning to those of you joining us from the West Coast. Uh, welcome to our webinar today uh, titled Private Equities Attacks on Basic Human Needs. Uh, we're going to uh, do introductions today at, at the top of the, my name is Ricardo Valadez. I'm the Private Equity Campaign Manager with Americans for Financial Reform. And uh, we're pleased to host this webinar with uh, the News Guild. And we both welcome you um, to, to cover what we're going to uh, go over today. Uh, we're going to do some introductions. I'm going to introduce the panelists at the top of the hour. Um, and I will talk a little bit about what is private equity, you know, why, why are they so uh, problematic in, in the economy, and uh, quickly hand it over to our panelists uh, who can speak specifically to the impact of private equity on specific um, parts of the economy. Uh, specifically uh, media and democracy, housing, healthcare, and the environment. Uh, and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions and answers. Um, as you put those in the chat, uh, I'll, be, I'll be seeing those and uh, post some of those to our panelists at the end. So, um, you know, at Americans for Financial Reform, we've been uh, fighting private equity for, for quite a while. And the reason for that is over the past two decades, uh, a once obscure uh, industry known as private equity has ballooned from a trillion, <clears throat> a trillion dollar industry in 2008 to nearly four and a half trillion by 2021. Um, and be because of that, they've been going into more and more sectors of the economy, uh, affecting millions of people in the United States. Um, and so we've been you know, tracking that and, and fighting private equity greed in different areas. Uh, for folks who may not know what private equity is, private equity firms are Wall Street companies that buy up companies and uh, they pool money from pension funds uh, and wealthy individuals uh, to buy companies, and they promise outsized returns to those investors uh, in a short amount of time. And so they, they are responsible for some of the worst business practices uh, we see in, in the country. Um, and it's important to understand some uh, elements of their model that, uh, that other panelists will refer to. So they load companies with a lot of debt, uh, forcing them to often compromise services uh, to customers and patients. Um, they don't invest in those companies for the long, the health uh, of the company for the long run. Uh, they squeeze workers' pay and benefits. They force layoffs. Um, they often sell company assets, uh, making the company uh, weaker in the long term. Um, and they, they get a lot of profit at a, a, a small, a short amount of time. Uh, and they structure the deal so that the private equity firm uh, isn't liable for the damages they cause. cause. Uh, so instead of talking about that in the, in the theoretical, I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists who can speak to uh, the, specific, uh, the specific ways that, that those practices play out in different sectors. Uh, we'll start with uh, Penelope uh, Abernathy. She's a visiting professor at Northwestern University uh, Media School of Journalism, or just, excuse me, uh, Med Med Middle uh, School of Journalism, Media, and Integrated Marketing. We'll then pass it over to Evan Brandt, who's uh, a reporter at the Mercury uh, at the Mercury uh, newspaper in Potterstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, then we will hear uh, about uh, private equity's effects on housing. Uh, from freelance journalist and News Guild member Julie Reynolds, uh, followed by a, uh, a tenant organizer, Valeria Steele, who uh, lives in an Alden Global Capital owned uh, uh, manufactured housing park. Uh, we'll then hear from healthcare, <clears throat> excuse me, healthcare uh, expert and senior fellow with Americans for Financial Reform, Robert Seifert. Seifert. Uh, and f on, on healthcare, um, and finally, Oscar Valdez Vieira uh, to talk about private equity's impact on the climate. Uh, without further ado, I uh, will pass it along uh, to Professor Abernathy. Thank you much, uh, Ricardo. Um, I want to talk, as uh, Ricardo mentioned today, on the impact of private equity on journalism, which also has a very direct impact on uh, our democracy in terms of giving the news we need to know what private equity is up to. Uh, first slide. Uh, one of the things that's important to understand is the history of how private equity and hedge funds came to own newspapers. They actually uh, poured into newspaper stock, uh, began snapping it up in the 1980s and 1990s. 
uh, because for the simple reason it offered great returns. So they remain passive investors from, if you see the chart and follow the uh, dotted blue line there, uh, passive investors, at least from 1996 through 2005. Uh, because the returns actually exceeded the returns of the S&P 500. There are two critical uh, dates. One is 2005, caused the, the decline in 2005, and, 2000 and uh, 2005 and 2008. Next slide. Uh, so the decline was caused by two things. Uh, primarily, if you look at it, it's a market collapse. There was a collapse of the print advertising business in newspapers, uh, and an inability of newspapers still today to uh, compensate with a lack of digital uh, revenue. But there is no doubt that private equity and hedge funds uh, and the similar kinds of organizations, institutional uh, investment groups have played an outside role in where we stand today. Uh, we have had the rise of a new type of media baron uh, and they have proceeded to uh, in exact unprecedented consolidation in the industry next. Uh, today, we have uh, five major um, uh, financial um, newspaper uh, chains that own well over a thousand newspapers. Some of the largest uh, own more than 400 newspapers at a chance. Um, with 1916, we had 2000, we had seven. Most of those were private. Today, the, uh, because of the intermingling of funds, it's very hard to know. Uh, who exactly is private and who is publicly traded. In fact, four of the, the four largest publicly traded companies, Gannett, uh, Digital First, or, or Alt, and Tribune, uh, Lee uh, and McClatchy are all either owned by or indebted to uh, large uh, hedge funds or private equity groups. I've highlighted in yellow the uh, people, the firms that own, uh, have a, hold the primary uh uh, debt for all of these large companies. Next. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that we know what makes for a successful and sustainable business model for newspapers. And there are by and large about 3000 that I would say today are on a path to sustainability. They are all for the most part owned uh, locally or by uh, small chains. Uh, the, what determines the sustainability of a news operation is demographics, the demographics of the market. Obviously, affluent markets or fast growing markets are desirable for both advertisers and um, others who want to invest uh, and, and buy uh, both advertising and buy subscriptions and can afford to buy subscriptions. The ownership structure, all things being equal, independent or locally owned is always best because they're locally accountable to the to the community where they are. And then it's also the available capital for investment. There is, are no guarantees for business models. Uh, every business model depends on the market where the uh, group is located. Next. Uh, but in for, unfortunately, because of the way private equity tends to look at um, management of newspapers, which is the same way they envision managing widget firms, housing, healthcare, and the rest, it is much more a buy, uh, uh, consolidate, strip cost, uh, what appears to be strip cost. And at the end of a three to five year period, either flip, sell it to someone else or harvest what we have done. As a result, we've lost nearly a third of our newspapers in just uh, since 2005. Next. And we have, uh, we have had the rise of what I call ghost newspapers, where we have almost no one or sometimes in some cases, no one actually working for a newspaper that is still published using syndicated and wire material. Uh, roughly 60% of the journalists we have in 2005 it, that worked in newsrooms are now gone. Uh, we, uh, Evan will talk to you about what that means for him working uh, uh, in a, uh, a daily newspaper in Pennsylvania. Next. Uh, the, the loss of this of newspapers has been documented by scholars across the, uh, the spectrum, from political scientists all the way over to economists. Uh, what we know is without local newspapers or with very diminished local newspapers, voter participation goes down, corruption and taxes increase in the local market and misinformation and disinformation flourish. Next. Uh, the FCC has been very good and they published back in 2003, uh, 2011 a guide to what they considered uh, were the critical information needs all of us need uh, in regardless of whether we live in an urban, suburban or rural community in order to make wise everyday decisions as well as, well as long-term decisions. 
These eight critical information needs included things like emergency and public safety, health, education, transportation, uh, environment. Uh, by the way, transportation now has been revised to include infrastructure with things like communication infrastructure, such as broadband, economic development, civic information, and political life. You will notice that many of them are related to the uh, very sectors that private equity has gone into. Um, let me st uh, stop with the last slide. Uh, in 2018-19, uh, the Knight Foundation, in conjunction with Gallup, alarmed at the declining trust in local in both local media as well as national media, came out with a, a massive report on what we needed to do to, re, uh, to revive trust. And I think they define what we should aspire to in journalism as uh, very appropriately when they said, at its best, journalism informs the public on matters of uh, civic concern. Uh, it gives citizens a common set of fact, facts and provides context. Uh, as Evan will tell you next, uh, that has been very difficult to do as you work with an increasingly uh, gutted newsroom and in some cases, no newsroom whatsoever. Evan, over to you. Hi, folks. Uh, Professor Abernathy is correct in that uh, there is no newsroom. I come to you from my attic uh, where I work here, here in Pottstown. Um, when I first began, at the Mercury in 1997, there were 15 to 20 reporters as well as additional news staff and editors. Um, we now have two employees who uh, write as reporters. I am one of them. The other works in the courthouse in Montgomery County and writes for other newspapers that are owned by Alden Global Capital as well as the Mercury. Um, the loss of newsrooms uh, results in much more stressed workers. Uh, I haven't always had white hair. And um, uh, I end up during election time covering as many as 50 uh, election and uh, school, school district and municipality elections and local elections. And of course, I can't do that with any sort of depth. So as a result, I end up sending out questionnaires to all of the candidates. I ask them to fill them out. You get a lot of canned answers. You don't get a lot of investigation of anyone who may be in a bad way. Um, I have done some of those in the past when there was a newsroom and support and photographers. Um, I investigated a uh, local uh, government official who finally had to end up resigning because he wasn't paying his taxes. He was also a local contractor uh, and he was ripping off people all over the place. Um, a photographer and I exposed a chemical warehouse right in the middle of downtown Pottstown that was uh, had unsafe practices and how it was storing its chemicals. And the fire chief told me that uh, if there was a fire there, he would never allow anyone inside because there were so many dangerous chemicals that would catch fire and, and pollute the whole town. Uh, that's now a branch of the local community college. Um, our building, our newsroom was uh, sold about five or six years ago. Um, it was supposed to be turned into a boutique hotel. That project did not occur. So uh, our classic old building right downtown just sits there vacant, uh, a constant reminder to people of Pottstown about what used to be there, what they used to have. Uh, and that included some very sort of things that are hard to measure. I mean, everything that Professor Abernathy has said is true. I've experienced it. Um, you used to be able to walk in the front door and talk to someone. You could walk in the front door and have a reporter come down and talk to you. You could come in and pay your bill. You could come in and buy an ad. None of that stuff happens anymore. Those things all happen in uh, in a remote way. Um, and uh, it's also hard to find an editor. Um, I have an editor, but he is also in charge of several other newspapers. There is an editor in the Alden chain which uh, it's my understanding oversees 10 newspapers. That's not a recipe for quality journalism. That's a recipe for get it out the door as fast as you can and, and, and fill it with, uh, with whatever you had. Um, when I first came to Pottstown, the Mercury had a circulation of about 23,000. It's under 5,000 now in print. Um, and it's, it's not something that is uh, as vital as it used to be in the community, it's not providing 
the services that newspapers should provide, all the things that Professor Abernathy mentioned, um, particularly when it comes to elections and, and civic life. Um, I sometimes cover as many as, uh, I think the most I've done is I've covered three civic meetings at the same time, doing it remotely, watching them on Zoom and on my phone. And it's it's it can be overwhelming and things are gonna get missed. And that's not really the function that newspapers are supposed to provide to a community. I mean, we don't have um, we don't have a First Amendment so that you can cover car crashes. We have them so that you know what your local government is doing, why your taxes are going up, why your sewer bill is going up. It's not terribly exciting, but it is terribly important. So I hope uh, everyone understands that we need to find a new model to provide these services um, to to communities in order to to keep democracy going. Uh, so I will now pass it on to the next speaker. Thanks, Evan. Hey, uh, as a former employee of the same chain, I've experienced everything Evan has talked about. And I'm going to talk now about the same um, investment companies forays into housing. I've been investigating Alden Global Capital, the second largest newspaper chain owner in the country for eight years now. Um, and like any of these private equity firms, they jump from company to company to just find out what's the most pop profitable, what company they can extract the most from, and then leave the rest in ruins. Um, so while Alden is still very actively investing in newspapers, they just bought the San Diego Union Tribune, um, they are also investing heavily in housing. And so this is not an overview of the whole private equity housing sector, but I do want to talk about the ways Alden has done this. Um, the first thing I discovered with uh, the News Guild researcher, Tony Daly, who I worked with on this project, we started looking into Alden's mobile home community investments. And we found more than 120 mobile home parks that Alden was investing in starting in 2021. Most of them were purchased in 2022. They were mainly in rural America. They were under an Alden run company called um, Homes of America, LLC. And it was run by Alden co-founder Heath Freeman's summer interns who came from Duke University and are now set up and running these companies. Across the board, we were seeing rents going up 40 to 60%. There were constant evictions, um, almost no to no to zero maintenance of the properties. There were sewage leaks, just slipshod operations. These um, parks, the managers and Homes of America were ignoring their permit requirements. The, in one case, they didn't pay the water bill. for It was a $15,000 water bill. Um, and it even admitted in court in one hearing that its managers had no experience running these kinds of parks. Alton has spent so for, by our accounting, it spent more than 150 million to buy these parks, but those were the only those were the ones we could find sales prices for. And they use layers and layers of LLCs, these limited liability corporations that hide the ownership. And that's classic for these kinds of companies. A lot of them are registered in Delaware. <coughs> um, and there's a, <coughs> a disturbing link, excuse me between the funding of these this housing sector and Alden's acquisition of Tribune newspapers. And that is that the Homes of America chain is wholly owned by an Alden affiliate called Tribune 2 Finance 1 LLC. And there are other Tribune named LLCs connected to these mobile home parks. And so it's makes me curious to wonder if this is a connection. Alden is actually extracting these funds from the newspapers and using it to buy uh, these housing developments where these are the most, some of the most vulnerable populations, limited income. Um, it's a standard private equity playbook. They're not the only ones doing this. Um, the recent foray that I've now found out about and we'll be exploring more is Alden is buying property tax liens. They started as at least as far as the reporting and uncovering this was in Cook County in Illinois, where the Chicago Tribune is based. And they set up an LLC there called Central Region Tax Auction in 2023. 
and bought roughly $2 million worth of delinquent taxes on more than 600 properties. Uh, I started investigating and found that Alden is actually setting these up all over the country now, and they can charge up to 1.5% interest. Housing Action Illinois, an organization there, has found that more than 95% of these tax lien sales are from residential properties, mostly single family homes, and they disproportionately affect majority black communities. Um, so once again, here's this company going in that's known for destroying newspapers is now going in and literally taking away the roofs over people's houses, because if people can't pay that 1.5% interest, they're at risk of losing their home. Um, so I am going to now hand this over to someone who has experienced life in one of these communities. And that is um, Valeria Steele from West Virginia. Hello, um, my name is Valeria Steele. I live in one of the parks that was purchased by Alden Global Capital under the LLC Homes of America. They purchased five in my communities um, in 2021. And immediately, true to their model, they started with, we had a, actually 150% increase in the rents. Um, they also started with the mass evictions, the installation of rules that are impossible for anyone to follow. Um, in our communities, they did not get the proper health permits to have a valid license to operate the communities. And it did allow us to engage the resources of a law firm called Mountain State Justice to launch um, class action lawsuits based on their lack of the health permits and the breaking of the existing leases from the previous owners. Um, the problem that we're facing is the mass evictions and the rate increases have caused the parks to almost be empty. And their lack of any type of maintenance whatsoever um, has caused the de devaluation of all the people that do other homes due to the extensive damage from water, sewer. Um, the water and sewer is damaging the infrastructure, the roads, the electrical system, and the broadband in the area. So it's causing a multitude of problems for the residents. Um, in the course of the lawsuits, the multiple trials, we've also had to fight the court system because there are existing rules, there are existing uh, legislations. They have never once fined the company nor instilled any of the protections to help the tenants uh, that are available in legislation. So it's an uphill battle in this lawsuit. We are slated to go to court for the class action in September of 2024. Um, but the residual effects from not just the properties themselves, it's starting to affect our communities. The way that our municipal taxes are set up in this area, the personal property tax from individuals goes to fund the schools and repair of the roads. And since there has been such a dramatic shift in the population, um, just last week there was an announcement made that our school system alone lost 90 jobs. And the way that they deem to fix this is not to instill any more taxes for these property owners. They want to instill a excess levy to place upon the tenants and the residents of the county that are already in this predicament to begin with. And if it's not passed, then there will be further um, job loss and school closings. So on top of not having the... Um, residents a place to live there won't be schools and so um it's a never-ending cycle of um everything that a community uses to draw people to live in is slowly being taken away piece by piece and it doesn't seem to be an end in sight um thank you for your time and i'll turn it over to the next speaker thank you uh, good afternoon everyone uh health care um Private equity and healthcare. So healthcare has been an attractive sector for private equity investors over the past two decades. Um, in 2021 alone, there were over 1,400 private equity deals in healthcare, uh, totaling uh, over $200 billion just in that one year. So why healthcare? Well, uh, obviously, one answer is that's where the money is. Uh, 
17 or 18 percent of the of the nation's economy is is in healthcare, uh, but also healthcare is uh, has a lot of opportunities to make a lot of money. There are market distortions. We know we all know about the the existence of third party payers. Prices not really being accurate signals of cost or quality. There's a lack of transparent information uh, across healthcare. So there's opportunities to take advantage of that. There are loopholes in how healthcare is paid for, and this is particularly the case in the Medicare program, which is really ripe for exploitation. Uh, physician practices can be small, inefficient, decentralized. There are a lot of opportunities there for streamlining, revenue enhancement by consolidating a lot of these small practices. And of course, in a growing healthcare sector, there's always a need for, for new capital. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so private equity uh, probably goes without saying is fundamentally incompatible with healthcare. Uh, this point has been made in countless academic articles, journalistic exposés, and personal experiences. We'll hear about one of those in a moment. Um, the reasons are pretty straightforward. Um, private equity has a single singular focus on maximizing profits and the cost cutting strategies and revenue growth strategies that are part of the private equity playbook that are taken in pursuit of profit compromise the access and quality and safety of healthcare. Debt financing and real estate tra transactions, uh, other also typical plays in private equity, impose huge financial burdens and divert resources from what otherwise would be patient care. Um, and then the short-term ownership framework of, of the private equity strategy uh, is really not conducive to the long-term investment that's needed to improve health care and to demonstrate a commitment to, to, to communities and to the public health. Um, the health impacts of private equity ownership are dire. Uh, to single out just a few pieces of evidence, in nursing homes, uh, residents of private equity-owned nursing homes have higher mortality. Uh, a, sim a, a, a study uh, a few years ago found that the increase in mortality associated with private equity ownership of nursing homes accounted for an additional 20,000 lives lost over a 12-year period. That's the difference that the private equity ownership made. Uh, private equity-owned physician practices have higher costs, tend to use lesser trained staff with minimal or no supervision, and put pressure on doctors to meet production targets or to upsell services. So quality and, uh, and cost issues there. And then just recently in the last few months, a, a study about PE-owned hospitals uh, demonstrated higher prices and poorer quality. Uh, the study showed that, uh, found a 25% increase in falls and infections among patients in hospitals that had recently been acquired by private equity companies. Next slide, please. So um, there's a real life, real time example going on, uh, uh, sort of a classic illustration of the, of the private equity playbook here in Massachusetts where I am, um, the Stewart Healthcare story. Um, in 2010, the private equity firm Cerberus Capital bought the Massachusetts hospital chain, Caritas Christi, it's a nine hospital chain uh, uh, for cash and a lot of debt, about 600 plus million dollars of debt, and created Stewart Healthcare. Um, the hospitals, of course, as, as was mentioned before in another context, uh, assume the debt. The debt is, uh, the obligation is on the hospitals to repay the debt. Um, in 2016, so six years later, Stewart sold the hospitals uh, I'm sorry, sold the hospital's real estate holdings, the property, the buildings, and the physical plant to Medical Properties Trust, uh, a real estate investment trust, and used the $1.2 billion proceeds from that sale to buy more hospitals around the country, so to grow the corporation, and also to pay dividends to itself and to its investors. Uh, 20, so extracting those resources from the Massachusetts hospitals 2021, Cerberus got out. They sold the rest of Steward to uh, the Steward Physician Group, exited the investment, walked away with $800 million in profit, and left behind really what has become apparent, uh, a, a crippled hospital chain in Massachusetts. And Steward, the, the hospital chain, now owes 
millions, millions, possibly hundreds of millions of dollars in back rent and payments to suppliers. And we've seen here in Massachusetts over the past few months, stories about physicians who have to bring their own instruments to, to work because they're not available at the hospital. And there's been at least one story of a death because of a critical piece of equipment that had been repossessed because the supplier had not been paid by the company. So governor, the legislature, state health officials, others are scrambling here in Massachusetts now trying to figure out what to do um, to preserve the healthcare access for the people living in these communities, where, which in a lot of cases, these hospitals are the only source of hospital care for, for, for folks living in these communities and are classified in, in most cases as uh, safety net hospitals. Um, important point to make here is that even though Cerberus left the, the transaction uh, a few years ago, um, the, the private equity company, uh, but it, 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 the, the actions that it took leading up to its exit are, are still uh, creating the damage that, that we see today. Um, so they don't still need to be present to be causing harm. What they did leading up to their exit uh, is, is really uh, the, 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 we're seeing the outfall of that today. Um, okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, AFR, uh, Americans for Financial Reform last year uh, issued a couple of policy briefs with policy recommendations at the federal level for reducing private equity's influence in healthcare. Um, uh, the report identifies three main areas where policymaking or simply more assertive action using existing policies and laws can make a difference. Uh, we're talking about stepping up enforcement of existing laws, uh, fraud, anti-fraud laws uh, for against self self-dealing, false claims, and also antitrust laws. We're talking about changing the incentives and closing payment loopholes in the Medicare program. And we're talking about improving the transparency of ownership of healthcare companies. So all things that really uh, are attempt to kind of reduce the attractiveness of healthcare investment to private equity investors. And there's some traction, next slide please, uh, in, 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 and, and some attention uh, and, and movement around trying to curb the excesses and the, and the damage that private equity does in healthcare. Last year, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, finalized the regulation on uh, nursing home ownership transparency. We would love to see that expanded to other types of healthcare providers. Um, there is a proposed rule out now uh, on minimum nursing home staffing um, that, uh, that would uh, undercut some of that cost-cutting uh, strategy of, of private equity. And then just now, in, in process now, is a request for information that's been issued by the uh, Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Justice, and the Department of Health and Human Services, looking for public comment about private equity acquisitions in healthcare. Uh, we're anticipating some future rulemaking, some possible future legislation. Uh, in, in this area. And in fact, speaking of legislation, Ed Markey, who's a uh, senator from Massachusetts, is holding a hearing tomorrow here in Boston. Uh, uh, and uh, we believe that he is preparing some legislation to introduce uh, in, in Congress uh, sometime soon regarding uh, private equity uh, investment in healthcare. Um, let me uh, hand things off now to Oscar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I'll go ahead and start. Um, so private equity has become a significant source of financing for the fossil fuel industry, investing over a trillion dollars since 2010, uh, most of which has been directed, directed to acquiring substantial ownership of fossil fuel assets across the entire supply chain, meaning upstream, midstream, and downstream. Um, everything basically from the exploration and, and extraction of oil and gas and call uh, to the generation of the electricity power in our homes. In the uh, slide, we can see pictures of uh, a liquefied natural gas export terminal in Texas, and below is the Gavin Coal Plant in Ohio, which is one of the dirtiest coal plants in the uh, power plants in the country. These are both owned by uh, different private equity firms. 
the unique problem that private equity creates in this industry is that, as we heard earlier, private equity operates in opaque private markets where there is little information publicly available about the operations of these firms, and there is very little accountability. So as public companies and banks face pressure from divestment activists, environmental groups, and their own shareholders to reduce their carbon footprints, private equity firms have stepped in and emerged as what we call pollution financiers of last resort. They are using money from institutional investors, including pension funds, university endowments, foundations, to acquire divested assets and to keep pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere away from the public eye. Um, for example, most people wouldn't know that the Carlyle Group is one of the largest owners of gas-fired power plants in the U.S., rivaling giants like Berkshire Hathaway, NRG Energy, or the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority. This shift from uh, public to private markets is also very convenient for greenwashing efforts. The opacity around the private equity industry, it's a ripe opportunity for greenwashing. These companies are spending a lot of money to promote a public image of uh, being responsible stewards of investors' funds, of being responsible operators. Uh, in fact, in one of our recent reports, we counted how many times uh, KKR used the word uh, responsible or responsibility in their climate-related report. And they used the words 130 times. However, uh, when you look close to, you know, a close examination of their claims showed that these are mostly empty words. Together with our research partners at the Private Equity Climate Risks Consortium, we have been finding consistently that private equity firms are massively underreporting their emissions. For example, we recently found that um, Brookfield, uh, their emissions are actually 14 times larger than what they report to the public and to investors. To put just one industry-wide measure into perspective, the emissions from private equity-owned power plants alone are more than the emissions from the whole country of Argentina. Um, we have also been finding a pattern of repeated violations of environmental laws and regulations and a history of community harms due to oil spills, increased air pollution, worker injuries, pollution from refineries and chemical plants that have uh, spewed contaminants to neighboring communities and all can be traced back and related to private equity firms uh, financial extraction their cost cutting and taking financial resources that should go towards capital improvement, maintenance, or uh, retaining adequate levels of qualified staff, and instead taking those monies and you know sending it off to Wall Street. It's uh, also important to mention that the environmental and public health impacts of these investments um, are unequally distributed due to a legacy of racist and discriminatory housing, lending, zoning policies in the US, pollution falls heavily on low-income communities and on communities of color, particularly Black and Latinx communities. For example, in our research, we have found that more than 80% of Carlisle's uh, fossil fuel portfolio is located in areas with higher percentages of low-income residents and or uh, residents of color compared to the average of the respective states where these assets are located. Um, to just name a couple more examples, KKR's fossil fuel portfolio includes several major projects with records of detrimental impact on communities. Uh, this includes the Colonial Pipeline, which is the US largest refined petroleum pipeline and uh, was responsible for the largest gas spill in US history. Another KKR investment, the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, cuts across land affirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada as being on their uh, indigenous authority and jurisdiction. And this pipeline project uh, allegedly violates the United Nations recognized uh, right to free, prior, and informed consent of some of the First Nations affected by, by the pipeline. KKR is also heavily invested in another LNG terminal um, well, the one we saw a picture before in Port Arthur, Texas, which has faced uh, a lot of opposition from community groups, 
arguing arguing that the plant would uh, worsen Port Arthur's already harmful uh, harmful air quality. Um, I'm close to time, so I'll stop here and close by noting that the industry lack of financial accountability is enabled by regulatory loopholes that allow private equity firms to bypass most disclosure requirements and to legally implement co complex corporate structures that largely eliminate their liability from their portfolio companies, you know, negligence, malpractice, or even from certain government fines and fees. Uh, thank you all for your time. I'll pass it now back to Ricardo Valades. Thanks, Oscar. And thanks to all the panelists for, for sharing your expertise on, on this um, uh, on these important topics. Uh, I'm going to send the first question uh, to Oscar um, since uh, we just heard from you. Um, uh, basically, the question is, you know, what are what can uh, what can government agencies do? What are policy solutions to uh, the, the the problem of, of private equity uh, in fossil fuels? Thank you. Great question. Um, so what we want to see from the industry is to make meaningful, meaningful progress on uh, on these issues. We want to see private equity firms align their portfolios with science based climate targets, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We want them to disclose their fossil fuel exposures, their emissions and their impacts. Uh, we want them to report portfolio wide energy transition plans and to integrate climate and environmental justice uh, as a, and a just transition into this plan. And um, also to provide transparency and political spending on related to climate lobbying. Um, you know, as you mentioned, as, you, as your question you know, suggests, there are limits to what these companies are going to do you know, private companies and markets. Uh, so it's not realistic to think that these companies will fully take the impact of their actions on our climate into account unless public policy forces them to do so. So yeah, the federal government must drive the assessment, the disclosure and mitigation of climate pollution in, you know, in all of our, in all of the whole economy, but in particular in, uh, in the private equity industry. Thanks, Oscar. And I'm actually going to open up that same question to, to the other panelists. What are policy solutions that could address um, the, the problems of private equity in the industries and the sectors that you talked about. I can go ahead with a couple of examples. Um, so in the news arena, there's a few things going on. There is some legislation in several states. I think it's important to remember that newspapers don't necessarily have to be printed on paper. What we're talking about is we need professional news gathering organizations, right? So um, there is a growing movement to support nonprofit news across the country. There are hundreds and hundreds of outlets now. They're not in a position yet to replace the local newspaper. That's unfortunate, but there are some models of even hybrid for-profit, nonprofit. So I don't think it's going to be just one answer. Um, in terms of legislation, people in, on the federal level, I think maybe some other people can speak more pointedly to that, but there are some state laws uh, coming in to sort of provide some shorter term support. They're working on legislation in California and several other states to provide government support or tax breaks for local news outlets. So those are some of the things being done there. I also wanted to mention on the mobile home park front um, in the state of Idaho, there has been some regulatory action specifically in response to Homes of America parks there. Um, so it, basically enforcing the fines and raising the fines for their lack of permitting. So there are some, some things being done there. And as Valeria said, there is also a class action lawsuit in the works in West Virginia. And then another thing people might want to know about, there is a organizing group called MH Action, which is for manufactured home residents. And you can find out more about them at mhaction.org. So just wanted to pass those things along. Let me pick up on what Julie's saying. I, I think one of the things that encourages me is the uh, amount of uh, activity that's been given to 
uh, the loss of local news and the implications not only for our democracy, but of, of the cohesiveness of our society, uh, of uh, community building, so to speak by not just scholars, but by policymakers at both the, the federal, the, the state and the local level. So uh, one of the things that concerns me greatly is what we've talked about, whether we're talking about housing, whether we're talking about uh, uh, environment, is that we are evolving into a nation of journalism haves and have nots. The, have, the haves tend to be in more affluent areas where people can afford subscriptions or and advertisers want to reach them and where there's more philanthropy. So one of the keys in nonprofit is getting philanthropy outside the city. 95% of the philanthropic dollars right now are going to support uh, organizations in the city. And then on the uh, policy level is getting um, uh, kind of re reimagining and rethinking uh, public support. Uh, it doesn't have to be direct, uh, although we could use more support of public radio, which has done a commendable job of trying to fill the gap, but uh, does it at such a, a disadvantage. But it can be things as simple as uh, indirect subsidies, like tax credits for hiring uh, local uh, reporters. Uh, one of the things that uh, we forget is one of the first pieces of legislation passed by the Congress in 1792, was a postal subsidy for newspapers. Uh, and as Julie says, it doesn't have to be uh, printed necessarily, but we also continue to face a huge issue in this country uh, where people just do not have access uh, to broadband. We want to make sure as we begin to roll out broadband under the Infrastructure Act, we also have uh, appropriate content for people to uh, get, and it's not full of misinformation and disinformation. So there's a lot of a good... Um, bipartisan support, uh, as well as regulatory support, several court cases going through that try to uh, uh, rectify the disparity between where digital dollars go and uh, where they need to go to support strong news. Uh, but that's going to take some time. And I think most immediately we need to look in a market by market basis of what needs to be done to, to make sure we do not become a nation of journalism haves and have not. Uh, I could jump in here quickly on on uh, uh, that question about policy solutions in healthcare. I think there are interesting opportunities in healthcare for combining the the authorities of federal and state governments uh, in, in uh, addressing this. So, for example, uh, the roll up model, the roll up strategy of acquiring a lot of small practices to consolidate a market and thereby being able to raise prices or self-deal and so forth uh, in, in an area um, is uh, obviously a, a, a target for antitrust enforcement, but the federal antitrust laws require that a deal be above a certain level in terms of dollars uh, before the Department of Justice takes action on it. And a lot of these transactions actually fall below that threshold. So they're kind of uh, below the radar in terms of federal antitrust policy. However, states have their own antitrust enforcement authority and, and can sort of fill in underneath there and look very, very closely at proposed transactions, acquisitions, and consolidations. And, uh, and some states and more and more states are actually taking a very active role in uh, evaluating uh, the health healthcare costs and setting benchmarks and and really limiting how much healthcare costs can increase and fitting those transactions, you know, the the, the antitrust enforcement with the healthcare cost monitoring, I think, can be uh, an, an effective approach. And then the other thing at the state level, just very briefly, is the public health function. Um, at every state licenses hospitals and other healthcare providers to to provide care, and there's there's an ability there to really uh, uh, very rigorously enforce the requirement that that uh, that uh, healthcare providers serve the the public health uh, and 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 set standards for that. And if they're not meeting that, there can be licensure uh, implications for the for the facility as well. So those are a couple of ideas. There are many, many others, uh, you know, kind of all over the map. But th those are those are uh, a few that 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 come to mind right now. 
Thanks, Bob. And while we're with you, Bob, I, I have a uh, question from the audience from, from you, and then I'll open the, question, the same question up to other folks on the panel in case other folks have a uh, perspective on this as well. But the question is, how do private equity firms exit their acquisitions without liability? And Bob, I wanted to uh, uh, pass that to you because you gave you know, the very real example, the current example of Stewart. And, and I think that could be you know, a good illustration uh, to answer that question. Right. I mean, it's a great question, and it and it, you sort of scratch your head about it. But but the fact is that the the the, the private equity, uh, the it's it's the it's the acquired company or the acquired entity that if you're talking about um, sort of debt liability, uh, it's the uh, it's the acquired company that actually is taking the loan and owing the owing the money to repay and I, I see other panelists nodding I guess that's the, I mean that's that's the way it works so there's there's very little uh, there's there's no liability to repay the debt on the part of the investors um, it's to, and I, I need a, a lawyer or a financial expert neither of which I am unfortunately to really explain the corporate structure of this but that's that's how it works is that the the acquired company which is at, somehow at a distance from the from the private equity company itself holds the debt and is responsible for repaying it similarly the rent that is owed if if a if if the company is divested of its real estate holdings its real estate property uh the rent that that's required to sort of lease back that property is the responsibility of the company. In Stewart's case, the story that I told, the hospitals pay the rent to Medical Properties Trust, uh, and Cerberus actually is long gone. Um, they're they're not they're not even in the picture anymore. So it's a it's a very um, well thought out uh, corporate structure that that uh that the private equity companies i think sell to their investors as a way you know at, at saying you know this is it, it, it's almost free money um for, for them because there are assets to to extract and they do and the uh the the the, the other end of it sort of falls to the uh the the unfortunate uh acquisition i don't know if any of the uh the newspaper folks have have anything to to, to add to that I can certainly add to it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's exactly the playbook that's used in the newspapers as well. The debt is acquired by the company. So for instance, the chain I worked for, Digital First Media, now Media News Group, owes all the money that was borrowed to not only purchase the chain, but also to make other investments. And Alden, as an example, then would also buy retail chains. It bought Payless Shoe Source, Fred's Pharmacies. And those companies can either declare bankruptcy or if they get sold to another buyer, that buyer takes on the debt. So the, the, the investors are not personally responsible for any of this. And in addition, it's pretty typical for these companies to layer the ownership through LLCs that own other LLCs. I've made these big complicated wall charts that show try to figure out who owns who. Hmm. It all points to the question of what's being done on the federal level because they've been able to pull these this off. You know, how are we regulating these kinds of structures? And that's really the big question for us as a society is what are we doing to control an uncontrollable industry that's just operating in secrecy and doing pretty much what it wants with very little regulation. And I know Elizabeth Warren has tried several times to revive a bill called the Stop Wall Street Looting Act. Evan and I both spoke in Washington about it a few years ago, and it just hasn't had any traction. Uh, maybe because Congress, you know, maybe is funded by <laughs> the financial industry as well. But I just want to raise that question that we really have to look at the structure of this financial sector and how can it be better regulated? And in our scenario with the mobile home parks, um, our particular properties were actually Alden Global Capital bought the loan from another private equity, and it was funded by Freddie Mac hmm. to a um, affordable housing scenario. So um, what's uh, interesting about it is the funding was from a federal level, but they allowed them to overpay 
for the properties by 20 some million dollars. And so that's something that needs to be looked into. Why would these federal funds be allowed in such an extensive overpayment for these properties? Like my property is estimated value at about $1.2 million and they $3.9 million. And so that leaves the conundrum that if they do what we think they will do here is that they'll file bankruptcy closer to our, our court date. And if they file bankruptcy, how will anyone cover that money um, mm. to take possession of the property? So what will happen? But why was it allowed in the first place? So. Thanks, Valerie. That, Valerie, yeah, that's a, a, a really good segue to, to, to kind of wrap things up here. Um, you know, one of the ways that we uh, kind of talk about the, the private equity playbook is that, you know, they they structure things so that they get all the upside, they get all the benefits and then sort of leave uh, leave often in bankruptcy, uh, you know, a lot of the damage in their wake. Um, that's why we call it, you know, looting. And we have a, a website called uh, stopwallstreetlooting.org uh, where you can find a lot of information uh, about stories like these. Um, I want to remind folks that um, you will be able to um, have a video of, of this presentation um, on uh, AFR's uh, YouTube channels. Uh, just uh, search for Americans for Financial Reform on YouTube and you will find a, a video to this and it will also be uh, sent out to participants. I wanna take uh, the last minute to thank all of our, all of our participants uh, and our partners, the News Guild, uh, for putting this on. And uh, we look forward to uh, working with you all in the future. Thanks everyone. Thank you.